All right, um, I see people um, joining the session. So uh, for those of you already there, um, welcome to the session. We'll wait for another minute or so. Um, count still going up here and then we'll, we'll get started. All right, it, it looks like the, the count is stabilizing here. It's still uh, going up a little bit, but let me, let me get going here and, and start with an introduction. So my name is Kai Giesecke. I'm a founder and CEO of uh, Informa Technologies, um, which is a, a startup company, capital markets technology uh, startup company based in, in Silicon Valley in the US. Uh, I'm also a professor uh, of management science and engineering at Stanford University, just down the road. Um, at Stanford, I uh, founded and ran the advanced FinTech lab that um, focuses on research at the intersection of machine learning and financial markets. Um, and the, um, the company that, I'm, that I started really is um, you know, expanding, extending, commercializing uh, the best uh, research that we've done um, at Stanford over the years. And uh, today I wanted to give you uh, a little bit of, a, of an introduction uh, to the work we've done on uh, prepayment uh, modeling and specifically prepayment for um, agency mortgage-backed securities. I, I call this the uh, agency prepayment 2.0, uh, slightly deviating from, from the title and the, um, and the brochure but uh, I think it, 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 it zooms in, it brings out better what we're trying to do here. So let me uh, dive right in here. I um, think uh, everyone agrees that uh, predictions of uh, prepayment uh, speeds are absolutely mission critical in um, agency MBS markets for the buy side, for the sell side. Um, that's the most critical piece of information that, um, that is needed to you know, build inventory on the sell side to select securities on the buy side and build um, outperforming uh, portfolios. Now, we address the problem of flawed and stale prepayment speed predictions, which uh, rank returns uh, and profits in this, in this massive $10 trillion uh, market. So let me take a step back and actually uh, show you some performance numbers before I um, dig into the technology and the deep learning systems that we uh, that we're building. So we create a new standard of predictive accuracy that delivers superior security selection capabilities to market participants. And just to um, uh, make this very concrete, I have a chart here that shows the distribution of the ratio of actual over predicted one month ahead CPRs, conditional prepayment rates, for a very broad universe of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac uh, pools, MBS pools, with vintages between 2013 and 2021. And the time period that we're looking at here is uh, starts in January 2019 and it ends just this summer in July. So it does cover the pre-pandemic period, the pandemic itself, as well as the post-pandemic period. And since we're looking at this ratio actual predicted, the ideal um, uh, ratio is, is 1.0, right? That's the, that's the magic target that everyone wants to hit. Um, I have a comparison here with um, yield book, which is by many seen as the, as the gold standard in these markets, as well as Bloomberg, uh, which is also very widely used by market participants. And finally, we have here on the left, the uh, ratios that uh, we are getting 
using our own proprietary deep learning technologies. So just to get a sense for the level of performance that we uh, achieve on a relative basis, um, the height of a, um, of a box represents kind of like the spread of the, uh, of the ratios that, um, that a system predicts. And so the, you know, the, the, the lower, um, uh, the less tall the, the box is, the, the less variability you have and the closer the box is to the ideal uh, 1.0 line, the more accurate, the less error uh, the predictions uh, actually have. And so on, on the basis of these two uh, characteristics, we are you know, strongly outperforming uh, conventional systems, including a yield book and including a Bloomberg. You know, Bloomberg's been you know, uh, a pretty bad at times and that's, that's reflected here. Um, if you wanted numbers, um, then our average prediction error is, is less than 2%. So we're very close um, to the magic 1.0 uh, line. Um, for your book, the error is a full order of magnitude larger at about 23%. Uh, and for Bloomberg, it's, it's double, uh, double that uh, at, at close to 50%. So there's a strong uh, performance boost that we can achieve using our uh, deep learning technologies. And what this means for the user is that um, it enables the user to um, you know, make high confidence investment and, and trading decisions that it's a very simple thing, right? With better predictions, more accurate predictions, you can much better distinguish between the good deals on one hand and, and the bad deals uh, that you should avoid on the other. So um, the, the space is less mixed, right? You have a clearer decision boundary here to distinguish between the good and, and the bad. Now, if you drill in and look at the underlying uh, data in the time series, exactly the same data, right? Just displayed differently. Um, you see where the weaknesses of the uh, other systems uh, are. You know, Bloomberg predicts, um, uh, you know, Bloomberg predictions have a, have a large error during the pandemic. Your book's error has been creeping up uh, post-pandemic, um, whereas if you look at our arrows, they, you know, you know, small compared to Bloomberg and Yieldbook, and they actually hug the 1.0 straight line here, this flat line, uh, very closely, so indicating a much more robust performance through, um, uh, you know, all market environments, including the more disruptive uh, pandemic that we've seen. So there's lots of more performance charts that, uh, that I have obviously, um, just these two uh, for the time being here, if you're interested in more, um, you know, reach out and I'm happy to share uh, much more granular information. So uh, suffice it to say here at this point that we have similar charts for um, pools of, of, of other terms like 15, 10, 20 years, we can drill in and coupon buckets, um, we can drill into vintage buckets, all of that's available. Okay, the other point I wanted to highlight is um, uh, uh, latency, right? Currently, uh, your system's updated only once a day. So in the morning, you have uh, refreshed predictions and analytics available, but those are actually based on yesterday's data, right? That um, um, systems are run overnight to reflect the latest information. So there's no way really to update um, the universe of data and analytics during the day. Um, and uh, that's another uh, point of innovation here. We've built computational systems that really um, run as fast um, that allows us to um, offer on-demand intraday updates um, uh, of predictions and analytics uh, over the entire uh, uh, security universe here. So that obviously allows you to respond to rate moves and other significant intraday events in real time rather than um, having to wait until the next uh, morning uh, before, um, before taking advantage uh, of, of the information. So what's, uh, what we've built is before I drill into the technology a little bit, it's, it's a cloud native platform that um, offers APIs for systems integration. So offering programmatic access to uh, you know, predictions and, and, and associated data. We built libraries for 
um, analysts to build uh, custom solutions um, in Excel, as well as in Python. And we built a web application, a screenshot of which you see here that offers various advanced tools for you know, security selection and other types of uh, use cases. Happy to run a demo at some point, just reach out and happy to schedule that. Um, under the hood are disruptive patent pending um, AI technologies, specifically uh, deep learning technologies. Um, the tech really goes back, as I said initially, uh, to um, multiple years of academic research that I led um, over at Stanford. And um, you know, since I left Stanford to build the company, we've really um, added a lot of, um, um, of new stuff to this uh, base layout technology. Um, um, and uh, that results in the, you know, very strong performance that we're getting on the predictive and computational fronts, right? So um, again, the boost and predictive accuracy that um, our deep learning systems can achieve is, is a full order of magnitude. It's not an incremental change. It's, it's a significant change, significant improvement. And that's, you know, there's really two elements to that. And I'm, I'll dig into those. One is that we are ingesting data of unprecedented size and granularity. Um, and the deep learning systems uh, that we build um, you know, really thrive on these, these amounts of data. They, they, they can extract patterns, uh, borrow behavior patterns from the data that existing uh, systems, mostly linear systems, um, uh, tended to ignore. So the boost in performance is really coming from the ability to uh, identify these, these new and previously um, unknown patterns and borrow behavior. Now on a computational front, our, our algorithms run more than 10,000 times faster than established standard um, uh, computational technologies. And at the same time, they reduce computational costs by the same large factor. So this is unlike a more standard parallelization scheme that does reduce computational, uh, uh, that does reduce uh, time, right, uh, and effort uh, up to a point, but it does not affect uh, in any way the, the compute cost, right? You're just spreading your load over a number of servers. The cost is the same. The time goes down somewhat, but not, um, but not that much. Okay, so let me talk about the data and the, and the deep learning tech under the hood. So in terms of uh, loan performance data, we are ingesting uh, loan level data that we source from the agencies, you know, tens of thousands of uh, agency borrowers. Um, the loans originated since uh, January of 2000 across the entire United States. So we have like 20 years plus worth of uh, monthly borrow level data. We track all borrow states, including current, 30, 60, 90, 120 days past due, prepayment, modification, curtailment, node sale, load sale, uh, short sale, all of these different events we track. And, um, and all of that information flows into our uh, prediction engine. So at the end of the day, we end up using more than 1 billion individual one, loan month uh, samples for uh, training, uh, the total number of samples even even larger, but but obviously we reserve some uh, some of the data for validation and, and testing purposes. Um, then we enrich the data using um, data economic data from macroeconomic, financial, demographic data from various uh, sources. Um, at the end of the day, we're looking at about fifty um, individual risk factors that track very widely you know, economic, financial, demographic behavior. And um, we're also processing on a daily basis um, new issuance data that comes from the agencies and um, you know, performance uh, data on more than 300,000 Fannie and Freddie pools. Their performance is updated on a monthly basis. In fact, today is a new release date. So we are sucking in that data as well. And it's gonna be reflected um, instantaneously in our systems. Um, before we go into modeling, um, it, it is actually interesting to take a quick look at the what the data say. And, and I've shown here the empirical uh, transition matrix for 
um, the average Joe, the average bar on the data set, um, it's a monthly transition matrix. So we're just looking like one month ahead and the different outcomes that can occur given the different initial um, initial positions, initial starting points that the that the borrower might have, right? So the way to read this matrix is that um, you know here these rows represent the 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 state that the that the borrower is currently in. It might be current. Then there's a very high chance, you know, 97.6 percent probability that the average borrower in the average month remains current. There's a slight chance, 0.6 percent, 0.6, um, yeah, 0.6 percent that the borrower is actually going to fall behind one month and the prepayment likelihood for current borrower is, is about 1.7%. So slight, but, uh, but non-eligible. If you have a borrower who is one month behind payment, then there's a good chance that the borrower you know, uh, uh, moves back to current. This will be a 43% chance. And there's a uh, about 14% probability that the borrower falls behind uh, by another month uh, and becomes two months delinquent and so on, right? That's the way to read this here. What's interesting is that there's always a substantial prepayment probability here. Even if you are several months behind, uh, there's a chance um, of, of prepayment, which is important to pick up. And therefore our approach is to really track all of these um, all of these cells here in, in the matrix properly. And in fact, also model out all of these different behaviors, all of these different transitions uh, along with the, uh, with the prepayment decision, right? The prepayment transition. So um, the, the interesting thing here, and that's the highlighted uh, uh, cells here is that there's a, um, a little bit of a momentum effect, meaning that if, if someone has fallen behind and say two months, it's, uh, it's likely almost 40% or 38% that the person is going to fall behind another month, right? From two to three months behind. If someone is already three months behind, there's you know, almost 70% chance that person is going to fall behind another month and so on, right? So this is kind of like the trajectory here. Once you are you know, falling behind, um, a, a couple months, right? It, it's highly likely and becoming more likely as you go down that path uh, to end up in, in severe delinquency, which for us here is, or, or default, if you like, which is a six month uh, delinquency for us. So what we are then doing here is, um, is at the high level, right? This is the unconditional, the empirical transition matrix. And, and we are modeling using uh, neural network, uh, deep neural network or deep learning, the conditional uh, transition matrix, right? So we are taking a borrower here, which has certain characteristics, attributes, you know, from the visual suspects of a FICO and the, uh, you know, loan to value, debt to income, et cetera, um, all of those variables, then the, all of the macro variables, demographic variables, financial variables at, um, national as well as uh, local uh, level. And we are trying to come up with an estimate with a version of that matrix, which is conditional on these observed characteristics, right? This is what's really happening here. And slightly more formally, um, we have this dynamic transition model where we are looking at the conditional probability that loan N transitions from its uh, current state, UN, at time t, right? That's the beginning of the month to uh, a state little u, um, uh, you know, over the month, you know, over the, over the uh, span of the month, and that's um, that's given by a transition function h um, that has a parameter theta here, and that takes as argument the um, the state uh, that we are transitioning to, as well as the list of of attributes, which include the you know, current state on mortgage, you know, all the loan level features, the borrower level features, as well as the various local, regional, national economic factors that exist at the beginning of the period, right? So that's probabilistically what we're looking at. It's a dynamic model, right? The, there's a time index here, little t, and we are keeping track of how information at the loan as well as the, the borrower level 
evolves over time and that has an influence on the uh, predictions and, and the model. It's also worth noting that this formulation automatically covers loan to loan correlation because we have a common you know, economic variables um, in that vector of variables here, right? So to the extent that um, everyone in a certain local environment is affected by similar variables, home prices in that area, or unemployment in that area, um, uh, to that extent, um, these borrowers um, are, are, are you know, correlated in, um, uh, in time, and that's reflected here. So, okay, going, going back to this one, right? So this is our, our guy here, this transition function that represents the conditional transition matrix, right, for different uh, use here. And our approach is to model this transition function using a deep neural network. And uh, here's the schematic. You've seen these pictures, right? Um, so I'm not going to spend much time on it, but on the left, we have the 50 or so uh, input variables, right, from the loan level to the borrow level, to the local and uh, national economic, demographic, financial variables. The output of the neural network is the set of conditional transition probabilities, right? So for every um, target state, not only you, we have a unit here. So it's more than four, it's, it's more than 10 actually. Um, and that's, that's sort of like the output of the network. And uh, on the inside, we have these hidden units, right, that introduce various nonlinear transformations to these input variables here and produce the uh, output uh, uh, probabilities as a function of these input variables and these various weights here, these edges, right? This is what we learn in the, in the training process from the historical loan performance data. Now, one thing I wanted to uh, pick out here is, you know, I could go on here for hours to talk about this, but, you know, one very important thing I wanted to single out are these nonlinearities, these nonlinear effects that the neural network is so good at, at picking up. And this is, as I mentioned earlier, really one of the major sources of the boost in predictive performance that we, that we achieve. It's the ability of the neural network to pick up these nonlinearities uh, in the data to identify uh, them and encode them. There's no manual um, interaction required to get the network to uh, pick them up. And that's, that's one of the major strengths uh, that we have here, right? And this is really um, a point of departure from more conventional approaches, which impose strong linearity uh, assumptions. And uh, the user has to kind of like hand inject nonlinearities uh, to the model to capture some amount of the of the nonlinearity that's that that exists in the data. Um, so uh, here's just an example. It's a it's a very familiar one and that's why I'm showing it. There's there's many more interesting relationships. Um, if you're looking at what the model predicts for prepayment versus the prepay incentive, which is the difference between the market rate and the mortgage rate, you're getting what's known as the S curve. And what we're seeing here is this is really model. The, it's predicted by the fitted model. It says that the sensitivity of prepayment strongly depends on the current prepay incentive, right? It depends on, you know, the derivative of the curve, right? The sensitivity depends on where you stand here, what the spread actually is. But it also depends on the on other borrower attributes, including the FICO, right? We get different curves for different FICO buckets with the low FICO bucket between 550 and 650, the blue one here uh, showing the least sensitivity to uh, rate uh, changes. Um, and the, you know, the, the highest FICO uh, bucket showing the really the, the strongest sensitivity, right? So this is what is known as an interaction effect, um, right? Here the spread or the interest rate interacts with a borrow level variable, the FICO, and there's many more interesting examples here of things that the model picks up automatically, right? This is not um, manually uh, encoded in the model. The model picks that up uh, on its own. Um, and this is, of course, a well-known effect, but we go beyond, right? There's many other effects um, 
between variables that we pick up that um, have been ignored by traditional approaches at the expense of, of performance. So to just take a step back and summarize, right? So we're starting out with this uh, huge uh, data set, more than a billion uh, uh, samples, 50 plus uh, risk factors, uh, observations over multiple um, e economic cycles, including the uh, great financial crisis, um, and then uh, train a deep learning classification engine that really takes advantage of all the data that exists. Uh, we're not sampling the data, right? We're sucking in all the data. Um, and as I just explained, that uh, approach allows us to capture really any nonlinear behavior, um, nonlinear borrow behavior that, that exists in the data. We don't have to manually tell the model uh, what these nonlinearities are. They are being picked up as they exist in the data, and uh, we obtain predictions of future, beha future borrow behavior uh, a month ahead. And then we have these algorithms that I mentioned earlier that allow us to go beyond the one month horizon, go all the way up to any horizon, and also aggregate um, across a pool of borrowers to the QCIP level, to the cohort level, and, and beyond. All right, there's, there's a bunch of use cases here for that, for, for, for the tech, right? There's uh, you know, security selection, selection of cohorts, uh, um, generics and, and stories to identify you know, valuable opportunities to spot areas um, that carry significant risk, to construct superior MBS portfolios, uh, develop prepaid narratives and, and identify uh, various market trends. And we've built certain uh, uh, tools and applications here that I'm um, happy to demo it if you're interested, but just a quick rundown here. Um, for example, you could look at the generic cohorts, um, you know, um, uh, coupons up here, vintages in, in the rows that have uh, attractive prepayment behavior going forward. So um, this is a chart that's, that's going to be outdated tomorrow. Um, it's, that's the one for today that's telling us uh, which of these cohorts are predicted to slow down in prepayment or, or speed up. There's really, you know, most of them are predicted to speed up, um, but there's a few that are predicted to slow down. And the, the one that I have down here, like the 2016 uh, four and a half is predicted to slow down a little. So that would be um, a, a cohort that you might be interested in exploring. You can go even one level deeper and I, I recognize it's hard to, hard to see here to the uh, story core level and identify the stories that um, have desirable prepayment characteristics. Um, uh, and then all the way down to the pool level, the QCIP level, what are the individual pools within the cohort, within the story or within the entire universe that exhibit a favorable prepayment uh, behavior going forward. And here's just shown the 1,000 sharpest breaker pools, you know, the pools that are expected are predicted to slow down the most over the next month. And so every dot really is a QCIP here, is a, is a, is a traded pool. And so you can you know, narrow down your search and identify the pools that um, you know, appear to be, uh, uh, appear to be uh, attractive over the next uh, month. Uh, narratives, we're, we're running out of time here. So there's more that we have in terms of narratives and, and, and stories. Um, last thing I wanted to show is um, another nice application that we built is that uh, is pool switches, um, where you can start with a with a set of pools, um, you know, cross vintages coupons um, that uh, you know could represent the, your holdings or a subset of your holdings, and uh, we can identify with our tools the most similar ones, more similar, but better pools, right? So it, this, is, this is what the graph shows, right? We have a 17 or so random pools and the edges here represent connections to uh, very similar pools, but with better uh, prepayment uh, uh, profiles, right? So, you know, these are candidates to explore um, uh, for trades, right? Replacing your existing positions with ones that are substantially similar, but have more attractive 
uh, prepayment, predicted prepay behavior. So to, to close, right, so we currently um, cover about 300,000 Fannie and Freddie pools um, that are backed by more than 60 million individual loans. And every, uh, you know, every time we run a, a calculations, we really run through these uh, 60 million individual loans. It's a loan level model that we built. Uh, and we're aggregating then these loan level predictions um, to, to the pool level. We cover all cohorts, including all story cohorts, uh, currently offer CPRs one through six months out. Um, later on the fall, roll out uh, predictions beyond uh, six months all the way up to uh, you know 30 years. And there's a, there's a few interesting other applications that we um, that we currently are working on. So uh, with that, I'll I'll stop. We have maybe like one minute for uh, for questions. But if you if you're interested in and, and getting more information or looking at the demo, please uh, reach out. Thank you. Thanks, Kay. There's a couple of questions in the chat if you wanted to stop sharing a screen and then you can have a look. Okay, I do write that. Um, so let me uh, scroll down here. Um, so the first question was like on, on the performance, uh, how often was the model updated? It wasn't updated at all. So I showed you performance uh, starting in January of 2019, and the model was not updated over the entire period. So it was trained with data uh, all the way up to the end of 2018, and then it was uh, not updated again. So even the predictions for uh, September, um, you know, this month, are based on the model fitted with the pre-pandemic data only data uh, up to 2018. So then a question, can the algorithms be extended to emerging market sovereign debt? Um, yes, they can. Uh, we have looked at corporate credit uh, as well as consumer credit and the deep learning tools and the algorithms um, extend to these other credit market verticals. Um, we built a technology to be as credit asset class agnostic as possible. And we, in fact, plan to roll out uh, related tools um, for, these, for these other credit verticals uh, down the road, right? So the answer is, is yes. So then the question is, what data changes intraday? And is training data also intraday? So um, for example, you have rate moves, uh, sometimes quite significant during the day. And, and, and if rates move, then, of course, you know, all the um, expectations uh, or the predictions for uh, for the entire for the entire MBS universe uh, changes and so um, uh, should be updated accordingly. There's new opportunities that become available um, on an intraday basis, and with current technology, you just have to wait till the next day before you can respond and take advantage of opportunities. Um, and so that's the you know. That's the value that we can add. You can actually respond on an intraday, uh, day, intraday basis. Um, okay, so I guess um, we have to uh, stop it right here because these other sessions are starting to uh, starting to begin. Thank you very much uh, for your interest. Happy to uh, engage. Just reach out and um, you know, happy to chat. Thank you.